Hello everybody, welcome to a new episode of The Dissenter. I'm your host as always, Ricardo Lopes, and today I'm joined by Dr. Eric, Eric Schwitz-Gable. He's professor of philosophy at the University of California, Riverside. Most of his research explores connections between empirical psychology and philosophy of mind, especially the nature of belief, the inaccuracy of our judgments about our stream of conscious experience, and the tenuous relationship between philosophical ethics and actual moral behavior. And today we're going to talk a little bit about all of that. So Dr. schwitz welcome to the show. It's a huge pleasure to everyone. Yeah, thanks for having me. Okay, so let's start with a, <laughs> a simple question. So what is a belief? What is belief? Yeah, yeah not so simple. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's why I, I was laughing. So. Right. So I would say that there are two main ways that people think about belief in philosophy. I mean, it's a little more complicated than this, but, um, you know, a kind of the mainstream view is that to believe something is to basically have some sort of representation stored in your cognition, right? You, if you believe there's beer in the fridge, then you've got some kind of thing stored in your mind, which is the representation that there's beer in the fridge. It's kind of stored in your memory center. And then when it's relevant, you trot it out and, you know, maybe go to the fridge because you feel like having a beer. Um, that's representationalism. I favor a view called dispositionalism on which to have a belief is just to be disposed to act and react in a certain way, uh, behaviorally in the world, but also in your own private thoughts and cognition, right? So to believe something like that there's beer in a fridge is just to be ready to go to the fridge if you want a beer or to be disposed to think to yourself, ah, oh, yeah, there's beer in the fridge, that kind of stuff. And you don't need to um, think of it in terms of uh, stored representational contents. Uh, mm -hmm. It's really your general posture toward the world. That's what it is to believe. Mm -hmm. Okay, but do we have accurate views of our own beliefs? I think we don't. And that's mm -hmm. one, of the, one of the situations where the representational view and the dispositionalist view tend to come apart, although not always, uh, it's complicated, but if you take a belief like, I believe that all of the races are intellectually equal, mm -hmm. right? I believe Asians and black people and white people and, you know, everybody, they're kind of equally smart and intelligent, right? Now, what is it to believe that? On my view, it's to be disposed to act and react in the world in that way. Right. It's, right. Dispo it's, it's to treat people a certain way. It's not to feel surprised if someone of a certain race makes a smart, a smart comment. Right. Right. And I think we don't know that fact about ourselves necessarily as well as we tend to think we do. Right. If you think to have a belief is to kind of like have this stored idea. Ah, all the races are intellectually equal. Then you kind of, you know, trot it out. You say it. You feel sincere when you say it. That means you believe it. Right. And a lot of people think that way. But I think, no. Believing is really more about walking the walk, right? <laughs> Do you really treat people, you know, kind of the same in this way? And if so, then you do believe. And if, and if you're more inconsistent, as a lot of us are, right, then it's not maybe quite right to say you believe it. Although it might not also be quite right to say that you fail to believe it or that you believe the opposite, right? But it's just going to be a more complicated situation. But what sources of evidence can we report to when uh, trying to understand or trying to know if uh, we really have accurate views of our beliefs or not? Um, well, there's no magic bullet here. There's no <laughs> one great way to know, right? But if you, if, if you want to know, I mean, some beliefs are easy to know right? Like mm -hmm. that there's beer in the fridge or not, right? I, I think we pretty much know whether we believe that, right? But for right. beliefs like, I believe that my children's happiness is more important than their education, their grades in school, <laughs> right? Or I believe that men and women, you know, are equally ethical, right? You know, stuff like that. I think the best way is to think about in a kind of realistic way what are the real patterns in my behavior to ask people who are your friends who might be willing to point out things about you that are less than ideal that you'd rather not look at <laughs> right uh you know 
ask right. ask ask women if you if if ask women if you're a sexist. Don't think okay, I, I don't I don't feel like a sexist, therefore I'm not, right? You know, find some women who know you well and who are willing to tell you the hard truth. <laughs> right. Um, okay. So another question. Uh, do we know or are we sure that beliefs cause behavior? Um, that is kind of a complicated metaphysical question mm -hmm. uh, in the technical sense of metaphysics here. Um, here's how I think about it. Beliefs, on my view, are a lot like personality traits. What is it to, say, be extroverted? Well, to be extroverted is to be, you know, disposed to be, say yes when people invite you to parties. It's to be ready to take the lead in social situations. It's to be talkative. It's to be, you know, filled up with energy when you're, you know, surrounded by people. And, you know, it's all, it's, it's a pattern like that. Mm -hmm. All right. Now, is it the case that being extroverted causes you to say yes to party invitations? Well, it's complicated because you might instead say to be extroverted is partly constituted by being disposed to say yes to party invitations, right? So mm -hmm. the difference between causation and partial constitution philosophically is a little complicated. And some people think that you can say there's causation in a situation like that. And other people would say, no, when you've, what you've really got a constitutional relationship rather than a causal one. So then if we take that to belief, right, to believe, say, that men and women are equally intelligent, does that cause you to treat women as being just as smart as men? Or, or is it really just constituted by that? Um, either way, it explains it. You can say, okay, what explains why this person was unsurprised when the woman made the smartest comment in the room? Well, you're right. <laughs> Unlike maybe some of the sexists in the room, you know, he thinks women are, are just as likely to make such comments, right? So you can mm -hmm. still explain it that way, but you know, it's not that there's a kind of belief stored in the head that plays this causal role that we that you sometimes see in this in a cartoon picture of how belief works. Mm -hmm. But if we were to find out that uh, beliefs do not really cause behavior, let's say that someone acts contrary to their professed beliefs, would that then be evidence that they lack the beliefs they say they have? Uh, it would be evidence uh, that they lack the beliefs they say they have. Now, it's defeasible evidence. You know, sometimes extroverts say no to party invitations <laughs> right. you know uh, none of these things are going to be perfect 100 percent relationships but um yeah to the extent people act contrary to their professed beliefs then it would be you know the you think okay maybe they don't maybe they don't really believe that or maybe they don't 100 percent fully believe that if, it, if that's a pattern mm -hmm. then we would say well look they don't believe that or maybe they're in an in-between state so if we compare again with personality traits you know you, someone no one's 100 percent pure extrovert you know everybody <laughs> has uh, is a mix right you know and as you kind of are less and less prone to act and react in extroverted ways it becomes less and less appropriate to say that you believe it or sorry that you have that personality trait mm -hmm. for some people they're kind of in the middle they're not extroverted, right. they're not introverted, they're kind of in the middle, right? So the same thing with something like believing men and women are equally intelligent, right? You could you could be like really someone who just always acts and reacts that way. You could be someone who propon the preponderance of their dispositions are in that direction. And it's still right to say that they believe it, even though there may be some lapses, right? And then at some point you get to a place where you say, well, it's really kind of more mixed. Mm-hmm. And how well do we know our own conscious experience? I think we don't know it all that well, um, which is an unusual view in philosophy. Right. Um, so there's this long history in philosophy going back at least to Descartes and to you know Saint Augustine actually also, um, according to which what we know first and best is our own minds, 
especially our own stream of conscious experience, as, as mm -hmm. we call it now. They didn't use that phrase. Right. Um, so, and there's a lot of intuitive pull to that, right? So, for example, if you drop something heavy on your toe and you're experiencing pain, right? <laughs> it doesn't seem very likely that, so, that, that you'd be wrong <laughs> If you said, yeah, my toe hurts, right? People <laughs> say, no, no, I think you're probably mistaken about that. It's like, no, I know. Yeah. Right? So there are definitely cases where it's kind of hard to imagine being wrong about our experience. But overall, I think we know the features of objects in the world around us better than we know similar types of features about our experience. So if we take my, like, my pale green mug here, right? I know a lot about it just by looking at it, right? I know that it's, you know, kind of a cylindrical shape that gets wider at the top, and it's got this kind of plastic rim, and, you know, it's it's this long, and, you know, I, I can describe its color and its shading. I know, you know, pretty a lot about it by looking at it. Now, think about a conscious ex the conscious experiences that you have. Say, let's say you close your eyes and you form an image of, say, your house or your mm -hmm. apartment as viewed from the front. Now I could ask you questions about this image like, okay, how detailed is it? Is it flat like a picture or does it have depth? Is it vividly colored throughout or there, or does it not really get color until you kind of think about filling in the color in various places? Mm -hmm. Is it kind of sketchy and indeterminate or is it kind of sharp everywhere right and these questions they're not that easy people give different answers to those questions and they change their minds about them and that those questions are much harder than mm -hmm. similar kinds of questions about like the color of this mug right right we know that it's not like a hazy color <laughs> right we know that it's if that it's it, this mug has a certain depth to it and stuff like that right so mm -hmm. our experiences when you think about the kind of structural details of your experience, it's actually pretty easy, I think, to go wrong about it. Imagery is just one case. There are lots of other cases. But one of the things that I've, I've done is I've looked at the history of philosophy and psychology and the kinds of things people say about the structure of their stream of experience over time. And I've seen how radically what people say changes depending on the historical context, depending on the way in which the questions are asked. And those changes don't seem to correspond to changes in the underlying cognitive architecture. Mm -hmm. um, so I think those are all reasons to be skeptical about the accuracy of our reports of our stream of experience. I could get into you know more specific details if you want, but that's the general outline. Mm -hmm. But uh, do you think that it's reasonable to take our skepticism to the point Descartes took it or not? Um, so Descartes, you know, he was skeptical about the external world mm -hmm. and not, not skeptical at all about his experiences of it. And then he took those experiences as the foundation to kind of reconstruct uh, belief in the external world. That's kind of mm -hmm. the structure of Descartes' meditations. So here's, there's this radically skeptical moment about the outside world. Um, and I don't have a similar radical skepticism about the stream of experience, right? I think, yeah, you know that you're in severe, your toe is hurting a lot after you drop that heavy thing on it. I, I'm, not, I'm not inclined to think that that's something that we can reasonably doubt in most, most of the time, right? But I do think that this idea that we have some especially secure knowledge of our own experience, that it's more secure than our knowledge of the outside world, is backwards. I think our, our, our foundational and most secure knowledge is of the outside world. And then our knowledge of our own experience of that world is often hazy, speculative, and built upon our knowledge of the outside world, right? So if I look again at this mug, I know something about my own visual experience. I know that I'm visually experiencing green. Mm -hmm. How do I know that? Right? Descartes would say, 
I know that because I, I directly know my visual experience, and then I infer there's a green thing out there. What mm -hmm. I want to do is turn that around and say, look, I know that there's a green thing out there by sensation. And because I know there's a green thing out there, I infer, ah, I must be having green visual experiences. Right? So in that case, my knowledge of my visual experience is built upon this more secure knowledge of the outside world and this inferential assumption that my visual experience is what's delivering me this knowledge of the outside world. Mm -hmm. I get it. Uh, but is introspection reliable in any way? Well, I think it's most reliable when it's constructed upon knowledge of the outside world, right? So I know mm -hmm. pretty well that I'm having a visual experience of green, <laughs> right? <laughs> right? I think it's, I think we tend to be more introspectively reliable about the contents of our conscious, I won't, I, maybe I shouldn't say the word judgments, but the contents of our conscious, well, I will say judgment, contents of our conscious judgments than we know are of the structure of our judgments, right? So if going back to that imagery case, you know that you're having an image of your house, that's the content, right? Mm -hmm. And I think if you think you're having an image of your house, you probably are. Right. But the structure of it, like how detailed is it? How stable is it? Right. Does it have depth or is it kind of flat like a picture? How does the coloration work? Those are structural features that I think we're much less likely uh, to be accurate about. Mm -hmm. So I would like to ask you about an idea that you expressed in an interesting paper that is if materialism is true, the United States is probably conscious. So <laughs> what's right. that about? Yeah. So materialism is kind of the standard scientific view that the majority of scientists and philosophers working on consciousness and the mind hold. Uh, it's not universally accepted, but mm -hmm. it's kind of the default standard view. And that's the view that we are just material things made out of atoms. Uh -huh. uh, quarks and, you know, that kind of stuff. Uh, and there's no kind of immaterial soul or immaterial properties. We're just kind of physical organisms. So if you accept that kind of standard default view, which I'm also inclined to accept, although I'm not 100% committed to it, if you accept that standard default view and then you look at theories of consciousness mm -hmm. that are commonly accepted in science and philosophy, the kinds of things that they emphasize as characteristic of conscious beings, as revealing the fact that you have a conscious being, is that you've got an entity that engages in lots of information processing, that responds in intelligent ways to its environment, that has representations of the world around it, um, those kinds of things uh, seem to be the kinds of things that are sufficient on standard views for consciousness. And depending on your view, we could get into details about specific views if we wanted, right? But generally then, here's the, th here's the thought, right? Mm -hmm. Think of the United States, not as like an abstract thing, but think of it as an entity composed of people mm -hmm. in kind of the same way that you are composed of cells, right? So right. it's spatially distributed, right? <laughs> but the people are its parts. Mm -hmm. right. Think about that concrete entity of all the people of the United States um, as parts of this basically organism. Well, this group organism shares a lot of information, engages right. in joint activity, interacts with its environment, right? So it invades other countries. It monitors space for, uh, you know, asteroids that might be a threat to it. It regulates its smoggy exhalations it self-represents it says things you know it, it kind of presents itself in a certain way uh uh in interactions with uh, other organisms of its type like iran or germany or whatever right uh, it uh um it has self-representations it, it it has introspections like right ah we've just decided that the new president will be right mm -hmm. joe biden Right. So it can self-report. It's some of its states. If you look at the way that standard scientific materialist theories talk about what it is that's 
that gives rise to consciousness in human beings and in rabbits and in hypothetical space aliens or AI systems. The United States has actually, kind of if you go one by one through the kinds of features, it has all of those features. So that basically puts the materialist in a position of accepting one of three things. Right? One possibility is to say, well, actually, maybe materialism is false. This, this conclusion <laughs> is, you know, is too intolerable. You know, maybe there's some kind of special property that people and rabbits have mm -hmm. that the United States lacks that's not a material property. Right. Another thing is you could say, well, look, you know, yeah, kind of surprising, <laughs> but you know, the universe is surprising. The more we get into studying cosmology consciousness, the more surprising stuff we find, and maybe we should just accept that this is a surprising implication of our best understanding of consciousness, and we should conclude maybe there is a group consciousness uh, at the level of nations. Where the third thing you could do is you could say, okay, well, look, um, the United States couldn't be conscious, so there must be something that's missing. Let's go figure out what it's missing that rabbits have and human beings have and that hypothetical conscious aliens uh, would also have but that the United States doesn't have and then go search for that property that it's missing yeah although I mean and I think a lot of people would prefer that third option although I think one question I would raise for someone who does prefer that option is is there some reason that we should take as a fixed point in our study of consciousness that groups couldn't be conscious. Is there, mm -hmm. what exactly is our evidence or rational basis for saying, there's no way the United <laughs> States is conscious. Any theory that says that has to be rejected, right? We don't have like a consciousness meter that we could hold up against the United States and you know falls into red and says, Yo, no, this thing isn't conscious. I'm like, how exactly do we know or do we test? for consciousness in entities. This is not clear. Mm -hmm. So that's the kind of, that's the idea of the, of the paper. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So changing topics, are ethics professors more moral than other people? No. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I've done a, a bunch of work on this. I, that, I found that question interesting. And starting in 2007, I did a whole bunch of empirical work on this, mostly collaborative with Josh Rust, a uh, philosopher at Stetson University, mm -hmm. um, where we basically went through all of the empirical measures that we could find uh, and think of for to compare the moral behavior of uh, philosophers who specialize in ethics mm -hmm. with the moral behavior of other similar groups where there are two comparison groups were usually other philosophers who don't specialize in ethics or professors yeah. in departments other than philosophy those are the best comparison groups because then you're looking at people with similar educational backgrounds similar social backgrounds similar levels of income that sort of thing right mm -hmm. so when you look at as systematically as we could the behavior of professional ethicists compared to those other groups across across a wide variety of measures and we've got like maybe 17 different measures we've used. Uh, over and over again, we see the ethicists are behaving basically the same as the other professors. Uh, we found one measure where maybe ethicists were behaving a little bit worse, but, but generally the pattern seems to be they behave about the same. They give about the same amount to charity. Uh, they, uh, they, respond to undergraduate emails at about the same rate. They're just about as similarly likely to engage in what most people think of as the public duty of voting in uh, public elections. Mm -hmm. uh, they're similar, they have similar levels of courtesy and discourtesy at philosophy meetings, like we measured how often people leave behind trash at their seats and, you know, talk uh, loudly while people are giving presentations, stuff like that. And just one more thing I'll mention, because you know, all of that is kind of a little trivial maybe, but um, we also looked at the rates at which philosophers joined the Nazi party in 1930s Germany. We didn't see philosophers being any less likely to join the Nazi party than were people from other departments uh, 
and um, in fact, maybe a little more likely. So just across a wide variety of behaviors, we had we didn't find any particular tendency for ethicists to behave better. better. Now, um, I think the most interesting of these results actually concerns uh, vegetarianism. So we could get into that if you want. Right. Uh, but uh, yeah, before we get into that, let me just ask you uh, another question. So w what does all of that mean exactly? Does that mean then that just uh, thinking about and using reasoning to arrive at normative judgments uh, doesn't matter that much, that it's much more an, about other psychological aspects, like, I don't know, I don't know if you studied that specifically, but for example, personality or something like that? Yeah, I think, um, yeah, the reason that this is interesting and important, I think, is that it does suggest something like um, engaging in philosophical reasoning about ethical issues has a pretty tenuous connection with your actual behavior in the world, right? Mm -hmm. And this has some resonance with the stuff we were talking about with belief earlier mm -hmm. on, right? Right. You know, my attitude toward belief is that it really has to do not so much with like the intellectual thing that you say to yourself, but how you act in the world. Mm -hmm. And so similarly with respect to ethics, I think there's this kind of disconnection bet often between what people think to themselves intellectually and the actual moral choices they make. Mm -hmm. um, so what drives our real moral behavior? Uh, that's complicated and difficult. Um, and I'm not, I haven't done my own research on that. Mm -hmm. My inclination is to think that um, social conformity uh, and peer examples uh, are probably the most important driver of ethical behavioral choices. People tend to do what they see their friends and peers doing. Uh, mm -hmm. So uh, tell us then about the beat uh, on uh, veganism then. Right, so so we, uh, Josh and I ran this study in 2009 and uh, this was the study, well I mean we ran a bunch of studies but the one that I'm going to mention was in 2009. So we sent yeah. these questionnaires to a bunch of philosophers in the United States. Uh, we got responses from two, about two-thirds of them, well 60% of them uh, philosophers and non-philosophers uh, from other departments in the same universities. And one of the questions that we asked in the survey was, uh, we asked them to rate on a scale from very morally bad to very morally good, mm -hmm. regularly eating the meat of mammals such as beef or pork. Right. Uh, and then later in the survey, we asked them, at your last evening meal, not including snacks, did you eat the meat of a mammal? Uh, so, in the first part of the questionnaire, we found the majority of ethicists in the United States, 60%, rated it somewhere on the morally bad side of the scale, right? So, they're basically saying eating the meat of mammals, <laughs> right, eating red meat, or, you know, there are different ways you could phrase it, you know, who knows exactly what the best way is, right? But basically, they're saying eating the meat of mammals is morally bad. Um, but then, on the the self-report part of the questionnaire, ethicists were no more likely to, well, they were just equally likely to have reported eating the meat of a mammal at their previous evening meal, as were the members of the other groups, right? So I think it was 37% of the ethicists reported having done so, uh, compared to 38% of the groups overall, something like that. So um, what we found was this, oh, sorry, so the, <laughs> I forgot to mention the comparison opinion results, right? So the ethicists, mm -hmm. 60% of them said, rated it as bad. 45% of the non-ethicist philosophers rated it bad. And only 19% of the professors from other departments did. And so that's a pretty mm -hmm. big difference in moral opinion from 60% to 19%. Mm -hmm. But we didn't see a similar difference in moral behavior. Um, you know, depending exactly on how you do the statistical analysis, you might be able to tease out a little bit of a difference, but, um, but not much. Uh, so, and we we found a similar pattern 
uh, by age and gender, right? So mm -hmm. the pro older professors were much much less likely to say that it was bad to eat meat, and the male professors were less likely. And these kind of stacked up with each other, right? So if we, we look at female philosophers born after 1960, mm -hmm. it was over 80% of them said it was bad to eat meat. If you look at male non-philosophers born before 1960, <laughs> uh, it was like 9% or something like that. It was under 10%. Yeah. So this is huge. I mean, think about when was the last time you saw a poll that had like that <laughs> big a difference in some controversial opinion, like 81% right. versus 9%. I'm not sure about those exact numbers, but it was, it was in that, I think it was over 80 and under 10%. Mm -hmm. When was the last time you saw that kind of difference in opinion? That's huge, huge difference in opinion. But you yeah. ask... But did they meet at the previous evening meal? Well, whether you get a difference or not depends exactly on how you do your statistical analysis. Maybe there's not a difference, or maybe there's a little difference. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, I find that pretty interesting. The, you know, what seems to be, and I'm, I, I'm an example of this myself, right? <laughs> so it seems to be a common view among philosophers who study ethics is you know what, it's probably not morally good to eat meat, um, mm -hmm. but I guess I'm still doing it. <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, so I think that's kind of interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is. It definitely is. Uh, and are the judgments of philosophers any less biased, any less biased than the judgment of non-philosopher academics? Right. Um, as far as I can tell, no. Uh, philosophers mm -hmm. are subject to the same biases as non-philosophers. There hasn't been a whole lot of research on this um, because, well, partly it's hard to get philosophy respondents to psychological questionnaires. <laughs> They're pretty rare and thinly distributed group, uh, but um, to the extent it has been studied, uh, we have found that philosophers are just as subject to um, biases in their responses to moral puzzle questions. So even if we look, even if we just think about not the behavioral side, but just the intellectual judgment side, mm -hmm. um, philosophers seem to be pulled as, as much pulled by order effects and framing effects as are not philosophers. So like an order effect is when you ask question A and then you ask question B, do you get a different pattern of answers than when you ask question B first and then ask question A? And if you mm -hmm. get a different pattern of answers, then you've got what's called an order effect. Right? So there are order effects in moral puzzle cases. Um, mm -hmm. And philosophers seem to be just as subject to those order effects as non-philosophers. There are also framing effects, right? If you frame something in terms of the likelihood of death versus you frame the same scenario in terms of the likelihood of survival, people will answer differently, right? Even mm -hmm. though it's exactly the same scenario, right? Philosophers seem to similarly uh, answer differently, even for exactly the same scenario. Mm -hmm. Okay, so another question uh around the same topic, do philosophy classes have any effect on the moral behavior of students? Right, so, um, right, so one of the ways that uh, I followed up on the vegetarianism findings from the study that I described earlier uh, was by doing a collaboration with uh, Peter Singer, who's one of the leading philosophical theorists of vegetarianism in the world, uh, and Brad Coakley, and uh, who, another philosopher who, who has, uh, who's a vegetarian. Uh, and they both said, look, very interesting results you found about philosophers, but here's something that you might find surprising. You know, when I teach classes on eating meat, you know, the ethics of vegetarianism, a lot of students will come up to me after the class and say, wow, that was so convincing. I am going to not eat meat. I'm going to, I'm going to try being a vegetarian. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we think that teaching about the ethics of eating meat leads people to eat less meat. And mm -hmm. that doesn't fit very well with your results. And I, you know, so I talked with both of them about this independently and I'm like, I, I think 
the students are just saying it. I don't think they're real. I mean, <laughs> ethics professors aren't behaving differently, as far as we could tell, in terms of their mediating practices. Although I should say, when I say that, there's a there was a study in Germany that did find some small differences uh, between ethicists and non-ethicists in their mediating practices. So it's a little bit of a mess. But but anyway, you know, I don't. Even ethicists don't seem to be behaving any differently. Even the ones who say that it's wrong, I don't think there's any effect on students. So we said, well, let's test it. So we yeah. collaborated. And what we did was we uh, we took students here at UC Riverside in, in large lower division classes. Yeah. And half of them got a segment on the ethics of eating meat. And half of them got a segment on the ethics of charitable giving. Mm -hmm. uh, and then... We asked them their opinions about the ethics of meat and charitable giving afterwards. Yeah. Uh, and then the thing that kind of was really most interesting to me was we had access to dining purchase data for about a third of these students on yeah. campus here at UCR. Now, all of this was anonymized uh, uh, in terms of unique identifiers, so we didn't know how any particular individual student Purchased. We didn't want to violate their privacy in that way, but we were able to get kind of uh, data that was uh, that could be matched, so we could see as a group what's mm -hmm. going on. And to, to my surprise, <laughs> and the delight of uh, Peter Singer and, and Brad Coquelet, the students in the uh, uh, in the meat uh, the meat ethics sections purchased less meat on campus mm -hmm. after the intervention. Right. So uh, if you look at purchases of at least four dollars and 99 cents uh we wanted to focus especially on those because you know everyone's coffee and pretzels are, are vegetarian right you know we're looking <laughs> right. trying to look more at like whole meal orders right mm -hmm. if you look at at those um before the intervention both groups uh had about 52 percent of their purchases contained meat right so the mm -hmm. the the ones that didn't typically were like expensive coffee drinks you mm -hmm. know things like that not that many like garden burgers or like really serious uh, vegetarian obviously vegetarian meals um after the intervention the group that had the charity uh ethics i think they stayed at exactly exactly 52 percent you know or at 52 percent uh meat purchases but the ones who who got the meat ethics session they fell to 45 percent so they went from 52% to 45%, which is not a huge difference. I wouldn't have expected, I mean, I didn't expect any difference, right? <laughs> but I think even someone who thinks these classes might be effective wouldn't expect that you convert 100% of your students instantly to vegetarianism, right? Of course, that's not going to happen, right? So so that's actually a pretty sizable effect, 52% to, to 45%. So um, that was surprising to me. In fact, it was so surprising that that although we, although we published that, I felt like we need to make sure this replicates. <laughs> right, is this really going to replicate? So we did it again. Uh, we did it again uh, in a follow-up study, and uh, we found that uh, it replicated. Uh, exposing students to um, to this material and meat ethics seems to cause a, a substantial, uh, a small but non-trivial drop in their meat purchase uh, meat purchases on campus. So, so that's somewhat surprising was well, somewhat surprising to me now we could connect it back with this stuff about you know does this mean then that you know thinking intellectually about philosophy you know yeah. does in fact affect your behavior and you know that's maybe the most obvious interpretation of the results but <laughs> but given everything else that i've seen and done i'm i'm more inclined to favor uh an interpretation in terms of um peers right so this study was done in Southern California, and there's another similar study that was done by another research group uh, at exactly the same time, also in Southern California. And I think, here's my hypothesis about what's going on. Mm -hmm. I think that there are, in Southern California, a lot of students who have thought a little bit about vegetarianism, mm -hmm. but they haven't decided to become vegetarian, but they're thinking about it. Right. And then they come to this class and they see a TA who's like, here's all the stuff for vegetarianism. Right. They see, say, their peers nodding along, some of their peers, not all of them for sure, <laughs> nodding along. And say, yeah, that seems right. Right. They see, you know, Peter Singer as an example or the people, you know, James Rachel, who's, who, who wrote James Rachel's who wrote the article that 
uh, that they had to read for the class as an example, and then they decide to kind of give it a try, or at least reduce the amount of meat that they're eating. Mm -hmm. um, because they were kind of prepared in advance, and they got a kind of social signal that other people are doing it, and maybe it's not as unusual uh, and strange as they had initially thought, right? So that would be a kind of, it's not exactly social conformity because few people are vegetarian, right? It would be a kind of um, related to a social conformity expect uh, explanation in the sense that that you reduce, you're reducing the sense that this is highly unusual way of behaving and thinking. Uh, and that reduced sense then allows a certain number of students to kind of like decide, yeah, I think I'll give it a try. Mm -hmm. But do you have any idea if the effect you just mentioned would, that, would be long term or just short term? We have tried to look at that and it's super frustrating. <laughs> so so um, in our first study, we had data, we collected data for several months and we did not find any decrease over time in the effect size. Okay. Um, but the statistical power to detect a decrease in effect size was not very strong. Mm -hmm. So when we did the follow-up study, the plan was to try to follow up uh, with these students for a couple years. Uh, but right. then COVID happened and the campus closed <laughs> oh my down God. and all the, all the time, <laughs> there was no more dining data to collect, yeah. right? And then the vendor changed. So we couldn't even match the old database to the new beta database that's now uh, in place on campus. Um, so our attempt to look at it long term has been frustrated. But I'm hoping that that maybe starting uh, this spring, we could do a follow up um, with the new vendor and now that the campus is, is back in action where, where we could really look and see see over the course of a couple of years whether there's an effect. Mm -hmm. Okay, but that's about the philosophical arguments anyway. But do you know if narrative arguments would be more powerful than philosophical arguments in engaging people's moral behavior? Yes, it does seem like they are. So this is an idea that a graduate student of mine had, right? So Chris McVeigh was a graduate student uh, of mine as I was publishing all this stuff on you know, saying that ethicists don't seem to behave any better. And he's like, this is all so pessimistic, Eric. What you should think about is like, okay, what can we do that will make people behave better? Well, you know, why all the negativity? What could philosophers do differently, right? So that their teaching actually has an effect, right? And I'm like, well, I don't know. And he said, I bet emotionally moving narratives would have a, a big effect on people. So, so we decided, well, let's try it. <laughs> So what we did was, this is not in the context of philosophy classes, this is in the context of online research participants. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But what we did was we, we, we recruited online research participants to read various things. And then the <clears throat> dependent measure we used was, was the following. Uh, we, we, we said to participants, I'm not going to get the exact words right, but something along these lines, right? 10% of you will receive a, a $10 bonus uh, in, additional to, in addition to your ordinary payment for being a research participant. Uh, if you are one of the recipients of this bonus, how much, if any, of your bonus would you like to give to uh, an effective charity? Uh, mm -hmm. And then they, we give a list of six charities they could choose from with a brief description of each charity and a link to the, to the charity site. And then we give them response options from zero to ten dollars in one dollar increments. And right, so so that was what we were measuring. Mm -hmm. We also asked some attitude questions about people's attitudes about giving to charity. Um, and then we had uh, four different conditions. In one condition, they read a philosophical argument in favor of charitable giving. Actually, one adapted from Peter Singer. Mm -hmm. uh, in another condition, they read an emotionally moving narrative about a child who was rescued from slavery by charitable donations. Yeah. In another condition, they read a middle school physics text about the nature of energy. Mm -hmm. And in a third condition, they get both the narrative 
and the argument. Okay. And then we looked at how much do they give to charity. And what we found was they gave about $4 to charity if they got the narrative and about $3 if they got the argument. If they got the narrative plus the argument, again, it was about $4. Mm -hmm. If they got the control condition, again, it was about $3, right? So what we saw was it doesn't look like the argument's making any difference. The narrative, people give about a dollar more. The argument doesn't seem to move people at all. So that was our first finding. And then um, we did some various follow-ups and uh, replications of it. And in some versions of it, we find that the argument maybe moves people a little bit. But mm -hmm. what we find is that consistently the emotionally moving narratives kind of uh, get people to give more to charity. And the argument either has no effect or kind of a small and secondary effect. So uh, as a philosophy professor, what do you make of that? Do you think that in ethics classes, possibly philosophers should use more narrative arguments to convince the students or not necessarily? Well, not necessarily. I mean, it depends on what you want from an ethics class, right? Mm -hmm. If the aim of teaching ethics is to persuade your students by whatever means to become more ethical people, mm -hmm. then yeah, then maybe, you know, you should be doing narratives uh, yeah. in addition to, or even just instead of yeah. arguments, <laughs> right. right? But, and I, you know, I would hope that students who take my ethics classes will behave a little better in the world as a result of taking those classes. I would yeah. hope for that. But, but I think my primary job as a professor of ethics is to present them with philosophical texts and philosophical arguments mm -hmm. and let people kind of weigh the pros and cons and think about what their own attitudes are or should be. Um, so, so I, it's not, I think including narratives may be an important and valuable component Uh, mm -hmm. in getting people to really engage and use their emotions and think about things maybe in a different way than in a purely intellectualized way, right? Um, but, uh, you know, the point of teaching ethics is, in my view, not to, like, make as many vegetarians as possible or whatever, <laughs> right? Uh, yeah. so, it's a, my, so it's a little complex. Mm -hmm. Well, but at least, at the very least, this sheds new light on the assumption that I guess many people have, including philosophers, that by just presenting the philosophical arguments, uh, I mean, it, uh, that by itself is enough to improve people's moral behavior. Right. right, I think that's right. And if you look at something like the history, especially of applied ethics classes, business ethics and medical ethics, mm -hmm. right, the kind of history of them and the kind of most obvious administrative justification for them is that you want to create, you, you require this of business majors and, and pre-meds mm -hmm. because you want business people to be more ethical in the world when they eventually, you know, become managers and you want doctors mm -hmm. to behave more ethically when they, you know, and it's not at all clear that teaching business ethics or medical ethics in the standard way uh, has those effects. Um, so, we should think, I think, more carefully about, okay, to what extent is the goal of a business ethics or medical ethics class mm -hmm. to create more ethical people in the future? <laughs> And to the extent that is the goal, we should think more carefully about what kinds of pedagogy are more or less likely to have that effect. Mm -hmm. Okay, so another topic now. Uh, as with many other areas, uh, philosophy has been traditionally uh, a male uh, area uh, or a male discipline. Uh, has it become in any way more welcoming of women in recent decades or not? Um. Yeah, there's lots of interesting data on this. Um, 
let's start with the data on PhDs completed in philosophy, right? Mm -hmm. So almost everybody who gets a PhD in philosophy in the United States, and all these data are in the United States, because uh, mm -hmm. those are the data I really have access to and know, right? Yeah. Um, but most people who complete PhDs in the United States in philosophy are aiming to become philosophy professors. Um, and what you look at, what you see in the data over time is that in the 70s, about 7% of PhDs awarded in philosophy in the United States went to women. Mm -hmm. And in the 80s, it was about 17%. Right. And in the 90s, it was about 27%. So it went up mm -hmm. by about 10% per decade from the 70s and 90s. And then in the 2000s, it was about 27%. And in the 2010s, it was about 27%. So what we saw was this period during which the percentage of women getting PhDs in philosophy went up, and then it kind of flatlined at about 27%. Mm -hmm. And in right. the last few years, it's been about 30%. So is that statistical noise, or is it going up a little bit now again? I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, and then if you look at the professoriate, you see yeah. kind of a similar trend, but delayed, of course, right? Because, you know, a lot of philosophy professors are 70 years old, right? <laughs> Representing <laughs> what's going on in the, you know, 70s, right? So um, you see this kind of younger professors will tend to be more, more female than older professors, but it's really still only a minority of uh, professors of philosophy are women, and the numbers are not changing that fast and things may have stalled out um, you do see somewhat similar patterns at the undergrad level too um, where really for a long period of time since maybe the early 90s about 30 percent of undergraduate degrees in philosophy went to women and that basically has stayed flat since then and again maybe it's gone up a little bit in recent years and it's a little hard to know still whether you know what's happened since the 2000s is kind of a little uh increase finally or whether it's just kind of a little bit of a blip um, mm -hmm. but that's kind of the situation in terms of percentage of, of women uh completing degrees in philosophy in the united states over the last few decades mm -hmm. But do you have any idea of what might be behind that? I mean, could it be just a matter of the field being so male dominated that there's not enough role models there? Or could it be discrimination, cultural aspects or what exactly? Well, those are you. <laughs> uh, you hit very nicely on three of the most plausible explanations. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, <laughs> right. Yeah, it could be something like, you know, lack of role models, lack of thinking, you know, you s people take history of philosophy and they see Plato and Descartes and, you know, mm -hmm. Hume and uh, Heidegger or whatever, and it's all a bunch of white men and they think, yeah, right? The white men think, yeah, I could be one of those. <laughs> and the black women are like, that doesn't seem like me. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, so it could be something like that, a kind of modeling effect. It could be bias, right? It could be that there's explicit and or implicit bias against mm -hmm. uh, women. I mean, you see yeah. similar, there are similar things with race. We haven't talked about the numbers of the race and race is more complicated, but mm -hmm. it, but it's basically a similar story. Uh, it could be bias, implicit or explicit. Uh, you know, or it could be something that's not quite either of those, but it's more more, more cultural about the, you know, the, you wouldn't expect, even in a completely fair and egalitarian culture, that the percentage of every job would have 50% women and 50% men, you mm -hmm. know, so maybe there's something about our culture that makes the job of being a philosopher uh, something that, um, even in a completely egalitarian environment, would attract more mm -hmm. men. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. I think that's also a possibility. Uh, so I think we don't really know. It's so hard to know uh, what proportion of these things 
is going on. But I do think that we should we there has been a history of sexual harassment and bias against women in philosophy for decades that I think philosophy in the last several years has finally started to reckon with. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that has to have been part of the story. Uh, and do you think that if we're not completely sure about the causes, there's still something we can do to try to improve it or not? Oh, yeah, I think we can. <laughs> I think there are all kinds of things we can do to improve it, right? One clear thing is affirmative action, <laughs> right? <laughs> we can, when evaluating for hiring or for admission to a PhD program, uh, we can, when applications are similarly strong, right, have some degree of preference for mm -hmm. the uh, female applicant or the applicant from uh, an underrepresented uh, racial or ethnic group. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm in support of doing that, uh, you know, at least to some moderate extent. You know, mm -hmm. I wouldn't want to just like toss out all the white males, <laughs> 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 right? <laughs> but a certain degree of uh, affirmative action is, uh, yeah. uh, I think, completely appropriate. Mm -hmm. um, and I think we can also work a lot on climate, right? So there's been a lot of work recently on trying to improve the, cl the climate in philosophy so that um, there's less sexual harassment of women, uh, mm -hmm. so that people from uh, different racial and ethnic, ethnic groups don't feel alienated uh, and unwelcome. I also think that, and this has, this is justified completely independently of the goal of diversifying philosophy. Mm -hmm. There are lots of interesting philosophical traditions and ideas apart from the usual story of Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, then some medieval Christians, and then Descartes, and then, you know, some Europeans, and, and now, you know, famous white guys in the United States and Britain, right? That story of the history of philosophy, Right. I love classical Chinese philosophy. I think there's wonderful stuff in there. I teach classical Chinese philosophy regularly. Sometimes I publish papers on it. Um, you know, there's rich tradition in India. There's rich tradition uh, in uh, of Islamic philosophy. There are indigenous philosophies and African philosophy. And mm -hmm. I just think philosophy would be so much richer if we valued and respected those traditions and incorporated them in our writing and in our teaching. Um, now, not everybody can incorporate everything. I mean, it would be ridiculous to try to become an expert on all of world philosophy and try to include everything equally in your courses. So I think, you know, different people can focus on different things. Like I've chosen to focus myself on classical China. Mm -hmm. But um, to respect those traditions more and bring them more into philosophy, I think would be just on its on the face of it, a good thing for philosophy. And then it would also incidentally <laughs> probably have the effect of, you know, like bringing in people from different cultural and ethics groups who now see themselves and see their, uh, uh, maybe in the philosophers, see their own traditions that they identify with being respected and, and valued. Um, right, if you look at how white philosophy is, Mm -hmm. It's similarly white to things like German studies, right? Why is German studies so white? Well, <laughs> it's kind of understandable, right? That people who have German ethnic heritage might be more interested in studying Germans, right? Well, when you teach philosophy as basically the history of what white European guys have said, right? Then students might react to it in the same way they react to, you know, German studies, right? They see it as studying a particular culture. And to the extent they identify with that culture, they might be attracted to it. And to the extent they think of that culture as, well, maybe interesting, but not my culture, then they might be less attracted to it. And I, I, I don't think we should, I don't think philosophy should be a, 
a form of cultural studies of European and North American white culture. Mm -hmm. And I mean, with that in mind, and if I may, I think that a great resource for people to become more aware of how much philosophy there is out there uh, that is non-Western and non-white is Peter Adamson's podcast history of philosophy without any gaps. I mean, for me, yes. it's fantastic. He has all sorts of philosophers there, like uh, Indian, Muslim, African philosophers, so, and he's doing a great job, I think. I completely agree. So, uh, one last question then, and because, of course, throughout the interview, we've been talking about uh, psychology and philosophy at the same time, how do you look at the relationship between empirical psychology and uh, philosophy? Well, in the history of the discipline, empirical psychology and philosophy were really closely related from the early modern period and through the birth of the university uh, the modern research university in the 19th century until the early 20th century. Mm -hmm. And then philosophy departments and psychology departments separated. Yeah. They kind of, there kind of was an amicable divorce in which yeah. psychologists more or less decided we don't want to talk about the fundamental nature of reality and ethics and stuff like that. We just want to talk about empirical stuff. And philosophers kind of had to decide, okay, we're not going to do any of that empirical stuff anymore, <laughs> right? In the way that William James, for example, did empirical stuff and philosophical stuff. He's an example of, you know, kind of 19th century pre-divorce uh, uh, figure. Um, but, in fact, the, both, the, the mind is so central to both philosophy and psychology, right? That although they're kind of, I think the disciplines in a way needed to separate from each other in order to become distinct disciplines in the university context. I think what we've seen in the 21st century is the disciplines rediscovering each other, especially philosophy rediscovering psychology, but I think psychology to some extent also going back toward philosophy, especially ethics, yeah. uh, where, where uh, psychologists have been engaging much more with empirical, uh, there's been, been much more work on empirical ethics that's interdisciplinary mm -hmm. between philosophy and psychology now, whereas like, yeah. 20th century psychology, the psychologists did kind of mostly, not all, right, but mostly were like, let's not talk about, you know, like, what's ethically correct or <laughs> ethically wrong. Let's just, um, so, but yeah, like, if you're interested in aesthetics, you ought to be interested in how people respond to works of art, right? And that's an empirical matter that psychologists can study. If yeah. you're interested in ethics, you should be interested in the psychology of of people's responses and not just pure i mean you can be interested in purely armchair stuff i'm not saying you, you need to be right but it's clearly integral to ethics i think and should be part of how uh the discipline as a whole even if not every individual ethicist thinks right like let's connect this up with how people actually think right obviously philosophy of mind you know is going to be connected to actual facts about the mind i think if you look at basically any sub-discipline in philosophy, you can see how it's going to be connected in one way or another to mm -hmm. how the human mind actually works. You know, epistemology, mm -hmm. right? The study of knowledge, yeah. right? Well, it's kind of relevant to the study of knowledge, right? How do people actually think, mm -hmm. right? So so I think there's this, been this wonderful tendency in the 21st century for the, for the two disciplines to reconnect and for philosophers especially to get out of the kind of a priori armchair and start thinking about uh, you know, how psychology and other empirical disciplines are relevant uh, to their thinking. And, so, and in some cases, like my own case, actually run some experiments themselves. Right. Okay, so let's end on that note and Dr. Dr. Schwitzgebel, just before we go, would you like to tell people where they can find you and your work on the internet? Sure, I have a blog called The Splintered Mind. Mm -hmm. So I post, post there approximately weekly uh, thoughts on all these kinds of issues that we've been talking about. Um, I'm also have a uh, I'm out there on Twitter at uh, Eschwitz. Uh, so those are probably the two easiest ways. 
Okay, great. So thank you so much for taking the time to come on the show. And it's been a real pleasure to talk to you. Yeah, it's been a pleasure chatting. Thanks for having me.